I tend to stay in the clouds with my work, my creativity, with my poetry. Like it's very up there. And the community of artists I work with, they're always like, bro, I don't know what you're talking about until three years later. Like I just, it's so up there. Like bring, while you're writing a book, bring it down to us. Like get it to the soil. What's the ground level? What are you trying to say? So that was really, you know, the collaborative part, like of them saying, hey, you should add this and be being like, you're right. And that was the way that, you know, they kind of land on doing. Welcome to the podcast, Tapping Creativity, with myself, Matthew C. Temple. And each week, we're going to dive into questions and issues and inspiration around creativity and the creative process. And this week, I am joined by a Super special guest. Uh, we have a propaganda with us. Uh, he is an activist, a poet, an educator, the son of a Black Panther. And uh, right now I am holding his a copy of his uh, debut book. It is a collection of essays, poetry. It's Terraform, Building a Better World. And, um, you know, I have to say I absolutely loved this book. And I think that it's so important. It's a concept I've been thinking about actually for a long time, uh, which is, you know, as a storyteller myself, as a, as a filmmaker, as a creative, that's become clear that when, when the words that I use, the ideas that I share, um, the thoughts that I have basically form the world that I live in. And as, since I put my work out there, it also forms the world that other people live in. And I just yep. love that Prop brought this right into his book. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. And even more, thank you for writing what I think is a vital book for people to be reading right now. Man, thank you so much, man. Yeah, and you you nailed it. Interview done. That's exactly <laughs> was the hope. And then what I was trying to communicate. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, beautiful. So before we go in any further, you know, since we might as well go ahead and start at the very front, you know, you studied as a as an illustrator, you said, so I know you've got this path from visual artist to spoken word musician rapper. Yeah, yeah. But that also tells me that uh, just from reading your book, I got about halfway through and I'm like, I think my first question is, tell me about the symbology here, because there's a lot on this, pic yeah. on this picture. Yeah, so the artist is this sister named uh, Murr Young. She has these series of these like amazing collages that she did with um, indigenous women originally. Just this like very sort of like cosmic, just like iconic way of thinking about recasting of the indigenous. And I've known her forever. She's from Long Beach. And as her art started growing, I was like, this is an when it comes to the the publisher, I'm like, it's a non-starter. She's doing the cover. And the illustrations are like, she's doing it. It's like, do not pass go. She's the person. And so the symbol the symbolism in the in the cover, a lot of that, like I just gave her, I was like, look, you do it. I am I want I want you to be fully yourself. So the tr there's a there's a tree that's kind of graded grayed grayed out and it's an acacia tree from Ethiopia from my own Ethiopian trip the the bird the flowers you know the the leaves it all has to do with this idea of like what she kind of landed on was like all of that bird the flowers the leaves myself it's all the soil and it's all mm -hmm. sacred so piecing it all together to know that like this is this is what we're trying to say. We're building a sacred world from sacred soil. Uh, so that's kind of like the whole concept with it. Um, but yeah, that tree behind there is like, it's like I said, it's kind of grayed out, but I was, I was pretty like work this tree in somehow, please. You uh, know, she did it. She, she yeah. did it beautifully. I, I love that. And I, it, yeah, it's funny that you said that too, because I didn't notice it at first, even when I first asked the question, yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, look at that. The acacia tree. I've, I've got yeah. um, pictures of those from my time walking, doing a lot of walking in, in yeah. East Africa as well. We just kind of touched on this right at the very beginning is that sort of the telling, telling better stories, shifting the language that we're using, bringing a lot of awareness and consciousness into mm -hmm. what we speak. I just saw this quote the other day by a guy named Stephen Jenkinson, and he was like, basically, the inevitable is only inevitable because it's the words that we're using. 
So you know, good. We, right? Yeah. You know, every word in your book is is thought out in some way or another, or if it's not totally thought out, it is, it comes from, you know, it comes from this sort of creative well that has obviously yeah. a lot of, of thinking in it. But tell me the process that you went through from getting to writing this book and this idea of Terraform for you, for us here. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a three year process of thinking and idealizing about like, what am I trying to say? My manager asked me once, like, what do you want to talk about for the next 10 years? And I was like, Whoa, 10 years. Okay. Um, you know, and, uh, just like, so that meant that like to my core, what are something I believe, like I want to leave the world, you know, and that's where the, the sort of origins of this process kind of like started. And then in, in the, and from a, a more tactile um, approach, I usually write my normal, like creative processes. I write for performance. Like most of the time I'm like, how is this going to be live? Will this translate live? Will this, will this communicate? So in my head, even as I'm writing, I'm thinking about the pregnant pauses. I'm thinking about the pacing. I'm thinking about all that. Cause I'm thinking about performing it. The book, since I know I'm not performing it, I'm like, oh, these words really need to do all the work. So yeah, there was a, a ton of intentionality in trying to make just the words do what I would normally add to with performance. And, um, and then letting that go and being like, well, you're going to hear it in your own voice. You know, you're going to read it at the pace that you read in your own head and just being like, okay, now, now that it's out of me, it's like, well, it's, it's up to y'all now. But yeah, the word choice, it was because I'm like, the words have to do the work, you know, and, and, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the process of that. But yeah, I, I had been idealizing around the concept for, I mean, for at least three years, you know? Yeah. So yeah. actually I want to jump back just for a second, cause you were talking about Murray Young and doing, doing this mm -hmm. and, and as a, as a, in your brand of creativity, even when you just said, you know, to, to your publisher, you know, this is a non-star, this is someone I want to work with. You're talking about collaboration. You're ta talking about trusting the people that mm -hmm. you work with to yeah. like, you're not going across this finish line on your own, whether you're making a no. book or whether you're, you're, you're performing. So mm -hmm. what is your sort of collaborative process and how does that work for you? Mine is, I love that. Mine is, it's community-based, it's trust-based. It's like, I expect if, unless it's a mentoring situation, but if we're like, we're putting on something, putting together something, I expect that you've done your 10,000 hours yeah. because that's why you're in the room. Right. You know what I'm saying? And if I feel like I can accomplish this without you, then why are, why are you here? You right. know, so for me, it's like, I want you to shine. I want you to flourish. I want you to do what is inspiring for you and I'm going to do the same, you know? So even, even in the creative process of this, I like, I, I picked for the illustrations in the cover. I picked, I did a little blurb about what each chapter is about. And I sent her seven poetry pieces and was like, have at it, you know? And that is because, yeah, like I'm how I pick, cause I, how I pick collaborators is, much more long and methodical so that when it's time to work, it's like, I don't even think twice. Um, you, you do, you don't need to, you know, the direction, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what you're doing, you know, and I'm going to deliver now. If, now, if there's a direction change, then I'm gonna clue you in so that you're not like going down this trail that, you know what I'm saying? It's not going to do nothing. So, and, and for me, it's like, I'm open to what you present. So if we're working on something, you flash something back to me. Now I'm inspired by what you made. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So let's, let's get back in. And it's just, it just makes up for a better final product, man, you I, know, and a great, and it, and I want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy the process. <laughs> Nobody likes somebody looking over your shoulder all the time, you know? Yeah. My last documentary, which I know you've got, uh, you've got a couple of daughters. You might, uh, if you've got Amazon prime, sit down with them and watch hardball, the girls of summer about, uh, oh, let's go. Okay. A few women in America who play baseball, not okay. softball. They're actually baseball players. It's a baseball player. Yeah. I'll, I'm I'll, 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 okay. I'll shoot you a link afterwards, but you know, in the process that was a, you know, it's a documentary film. It, uh, it, it took a lot of, uh, 
a lot of time and uh, collaboration and finding a story that didn't exist yeah. yet because it wasn't, you know, the, yeah. the world was happening as was happening. And um, there were a few times where I remember like, you know, my, my editor and I would be sitting in a room and we would just, we would really get into an argument. She was adamant it had to be one way. And, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, you know, as the director and as the writer, I had to, at times I had to call the shots, but I never, I never wanted to shut that down. I always loved the, the, um, you know, the, the butting of heads, the, you know, let's go uh -huh. ahead and let's go at it. And, and the way I look at it is if we really get into it with, with mutual respect, then at the end of the day, I also, like, I actually want to be wrong. You know, if I was yes. right, right. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. It, I totally get it because it's like if 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 it's all if it's all my ideas, then why are y'all here? I could have yeah. just hired a a little intern to just you know what I'm saying. Yeah. We don't have the experience to just like do the brunt work. No, but you're a creative. You're an artist. You be yes. an artist. Yeah, right. absolutely. And when somebody else proves you, like is like convinces you, that means you. That means what I always say when when I lose an argument, I actually won, because absolutely. that means I have something I didn't have before. Yes, I've gained an experience. I've gained a knowledge base from your perspective that now is making my perspective better. Exactly, exactly. And I think there yep. was a lot of that in, you know, in the book. And actually, I'm going to jump to this. I Hate Cats was one of your, yes. uh, 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 one uh, of your uh, poems, which I love. Yeah. One of the things that was so, like, awesome about that is that it was about this basically being wrong in some ways, right? Like I'm going to, I take this Absolutely. thing. I'm like, yeah, this is me, but, but wait, what, why does it have to be me? I've got to be able to, yes. to, to, to terraform myself. That's exactly it. It's funny. Cause I'm, I'm sitting at home. Like the story is a true story. You know, I'm sitting at home and I'm so pissed. We have this cat in my house and I'm just like, man, I hate this thing, you know? And then, and I'm laughing at myself. Cause I'm like, it's done nothing to me. It's just laying there. Like it's not doing there's, I have no reason to hate this thing. Then I started playing with it, and it was like, then its instincts kick in, and you're like, oh, whoa, that, look at this little cougar, man, this little mountain <laughs> lion. And it was like, and I was I was at home by myself, almost embarrassed that somebody might see me enjoying my time with it. And I was like, this is, ridic this is ridiculous, you know? And I was like, no, I've just accepted something about this entire species that clearly is not true, you know? Yeah. And... So what do I what do I do? Do I hold on to it and just have this dissonance or do I go, OK, this is, you know, and I'm like, man, this must be how like, you know, a racist dad would feel if like, you know, son, <laughs> daughter or son or daughter brings home somebody and you're like, dang, he's actually she's actually like a really cool kid. You know, and you're yeah. just like, damn it. Damn. What do I do now? You know, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, totally. Do you uh, would you either be willing to read that one or maybe there's another one that you want to read? But I'd love to. Uh, to hear I, you I, perform one of these because uh, that way anybody who yeah. goes to buy your book, which I highly recommend everyone who's listening do so, uh, yeah. you can then get a, a sense for the cadence as you're reading. Totally. Yeah, I totally read I Hate Cats. It's one of my favorite poems too. <laughs> All right, see, when I would leave for tour, my wife and my daughter, well, this is before my baby daughter was born, uh, they would bond by going to these animal shelters and playing with the cats. But see, here's the thing. I hate cats. Well, hate's a strong word. It's just more, I'm more of a dog person. These cats, demon spawns, I don't trust them. They always look like they plotting a murder, right? Like cats be putting in work. You ever watch the movie? What does the weird old lady have? What about the villain's pets? They evil. See, the ancient Egyptians knew that, and they built the pyramids, so they was on to something, right? Well, I would receive these, these, these terrifying pictures in my text of my daughter smiling in the throes of full bliss, holding what has to be the biggest letdown of a cousin. I mean, cats are related to lions. You share taxonomy with tigers. Tigers! Why are you so cupcake? Why does my daughter want to bring this thing home? Of all things, a cat. I hate cats. Well, hate's a song word, you know what I'm saying? I mean, but don't get me wrong. I'm not like a, I'm not like a bigot or nothing. I mean, I don't see species. You know, my, my, 
my babysitter when I was a kid, see, she had a cat. And I'm pretty sure there are nice, God-fearing people with cats in their home, but see, not in my house. They stink. They be rubbing their terrible pheromones all over my furniture, but alas, kicking and screaming, I force a smile on my face as my daughter brings this terrible thing home. And I'm going to be honest. I thought I raised her better than that. See, we are from a dog family. We stick to our own kind. Why couldn't you love a dog? See, these are just the words of a concerned father. See, see, people may think a certain way about her when she walking down the street. What you walking a cat for anyway? They gonna think I ain't raised my child well. It's not that this cat has done anything to me personally, but see, I know they kind. I be seeing them on the news. They be tearing up the homes they owners provide for them. Why cats be tearing up their own home? How come cats can't be grateful? Why are all cats lazy? They be complaining about their oppression. You could see it in their eyes. Don't the people that take care of you take care of you well? Haven't we had cats in the White House? Ain't that enough? But then this cat got into my home, and to be honest, it was it was kind of different. Actually, I enjoyed my time with him. But 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 the point is, I love my daughter, and I've already made my decision. It's not the cat's fault. It's I just hate their kind. Well, hate's a strong word. It's just my heritage. I come from a dog family. It's heritage, not hate, right? You know, hate's a strong word. We still talking about cats, right? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And then you're, the next line in the book, just I, I busted out laughing. The poem is just about race is just as much about racism. If you didn't figure that out already, yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's why. Yes, yeah. If somebody missed that, uh, they must also hate cats. <laughs> you must also hate cats. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that poem in, I'm going to ask you to talk about terraforming in your own words and kind of really where this, like what you envision with this. But before I go there, I want to say that this is actually this, this poem was you brought it up in one of your exercises. Uh, and at the end of each chapter, there is some like kind of things to reflect on, right? Uh, and not only reflect, but actually do kind of get out of your head and get out of this book yeah. that it's like just another notch on the belt for book readers or whatever. And this particular exercise was to listen to your life to be able to sort of turn back and reflect. What were you thinking and what was the process for putting these exercises in your book of essays and poetry? Yeah, man, it was like, okay, so I tend to to like stay in the clouds with my work, my creativity, with my poetry. Like it's very up there. And with the community, it's crazy coming back to that. Like the community of artists I work with, they're always like, bro, I don't know what you're talking about until three years later. Like I just, it's so up there. Like bring, while you're writing a book, bring it down to us. Like get it to the soil. What's the ground level? What are you trying to say? Which was really for me, that was the editing process. And in that one of my, uh, one of the homies was like, why don't you do like some like to do's? And I was like, Oh yeah. You know, like, so, so that was really, you know, the collaborative part, like of them saying, Hey, you should add this and be being like, you're right. (laughs) <laughs> you know, right. And cause I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it at first, but that like, yeah. Cause that's the feedback I get all the time. It's like, but what do I do with this? It's so far in the, in, in the, it's just, it's just so heady. Like bring it to, bring it, bring it down to earth. And I'm like, and that was the way that, you know, they kind of land on doing. I think that's so important. Like there's all these different things you can say, you know what to do, right? Like, you know, let's say if Mm -hmm. you beat yourself up about something, you know, like beating myself up about that isn't necessarily helpful, but it doesn't matter. You do it anyways. And the only way to get past that is through practice, through doing, you know, through engaging, not just your thinking about it, but doing. And that, I just love that. So terraforming as a concept, you know, I've been working with it. I, I did a whole series on the creative process with uh, two close artist friends of mine who run a school called the Magenta School for mm-hmm. Social Innovation. And they're working on this project called Worldmaker. 
and I saw them yesterday and hmm. I was like, I am bringing you a copy of Prof's book. Yes. Um, yes. Cause it's something they've really been working with, but I want to hear in, in your words, this idea about terraforming. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's just this idea of like, it's a science fiction, you know, nerdery word about when you find a distant planet, like the process of making that planet livable. It's called terraforming. Um, so in my mind, as a, as a creative, I was like, dude, well, as I'm looking around Earth, I'm like, it's getting less and less livable, whether we mean interpersonally, culturally, and also geologically, you know, we're, we need to rethink what we're doing down here, you know, and um, but how we got here was a process of terraforming, you know, so yeah. uh, if that's the case, then like, yo, if it's if our ideas are destructive, then let's think of better ideas, you know, so and I just thought the term terraform was broad enough to where it's like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you that something else is possible. You can't we can do this. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but I know we can make one. Right. Another piece around this is also like, what am I, what can I actually, you know, create? I think so often we have this idea that, well, or particularly people who aren't necessarily consider themselves artists by trade or creatives by trade is that I'm not a creative person or, you know, or I have an idea, but I don't really know how to make it. And you've evolved quite a bit as a, as an artist and a creative, but what was your kind of path into a creative life? Man, I think I was, a, I was always a, a artist. Like I was always a creative kid. My first love, like you mentioned, was visual arts. Some of that I think kind of sparked from just the Los Angeles scene in the era that I grew up in with just this burgeoning like graffiti and, and hip hop world where, um, this became such a uh, a alternative to you know sort of the gang culture that was kind of like burgeoning you know and 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 you know really really uh becoming the main story of of inner city Los Angeles but at the same time it's like well yeah there's this there's this hip hop scene there's these break dancers down in Venice Beach you know and we could hop a bus to Dogtown and learn how to like skate in an empty pool like there was so much other creativity kind of happening alongside this and we're all the same kids you know what i'm saying like you know your 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 local gang member can also ride a skateboard and they can all you know what i'm saying so you it's just this world that was kind of happening you know in my adolescence that really just was like I want to be a part of this you know and i didn't think of it as like a career at the time in the same way like i said every Every kid had a skateboard, you know, but yep. and every kid rapped like we all would, you know, we, we wrote raps, we freestyled, battled each other. We were having fun. You know, you don't think of it as a career until it becomes one. You know, right. I was like I went out to college. I taught high school for six years, you know, and I was doing music, but it was like. I'm oh. write a book, you know, what I'm saying like, <laughs> really, you know, what I'm saying like, yeah, those were not they were so far off until they weren't far off. You know, but I think I was always at the end of the day, like I was always an artist. I was always, I think in some ways, a communicator, you know. Wow. OK, so you went up, you studied visual arts and then you were a high school teacher. What did you teach in high school? Yeah. So I double majored. I was illustration and intercultural studies. And then my teaching credential was in uh, social sciences. So I taught uh, social studies. I taught, you know, world and U.S. history, social studies in a little bit of a little bit of psychology, but mostly um mostly social oh. sciences. So now through that period of time and I think I think this is I, I'm so glad you kind of accidentally dropped that in because the life of a creative or a mm -hmm. creator or as an artist is not linear. It's not predictable, at all. right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and not at all. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think sometimes from the outside, someone can look in and say, oh, that was a clear like that was there was a clear direction, a clear path, a clear goal. But mm -hmm. the world is constantly moving and evolving. And it's kind of the gap mm -hmm. between the, you know, the plan, because you have to have some sort of, you know, you got to you got to sort of get oh. up. You have to have some structure to your day. But then the artist, the artistry, the creativity is kind of in this, an unknown place in between the plan yeah. and what ultimately comes out of it. And so yeah. for you, 
somebody who like, like I want to hear about your time between kind of graduating college and then this time when you stopped having a day job, as it were. And yeah. what was your keeping your creativity going and your process alive and being OK with having the structure of a job while also doing this other stuff? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, man. Nobody's asked that yet. I love that. So I taught the School of Arts and Enterprise out in Pomona, California. I was one of the sort of like founding first or second year like teachers. When I got there, there was only a ninth and a tenth grade. And, you know, I helped to like really shape out and finish like building this school, writing a lot of the curriculum, you know, helping with the, the charter, like all these things. So I was working with this idea of art and business and education already. So yeah. the school I was at allowed me to be very creative. Like we made up the 11th grade, like we made it up, you know? So having that like as a job, you know, I never stopped, I never stopped imagining. I never stopped, you know, creating. Now in full, like it's funny because in full transparency, leaving art school was right when Pixar took off. So. I was in a, a a market with all these illustrators that were out of a job who like worked on the Lion King in like right. Mulan. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, there's just no jobs. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I'm like, I right. I can't keep I can't compete. You know? And I was dating a young lady at the time that was you know you're 22. You think this is right? You know? And and um she had a picture of the future. You know? And we you need to make sure you make this much per year so we can have our you know camper and and uh you know our our you know, our motor home and our house and our, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, uh, oh, okay. I don't know. I, I think I was always planning on being an artist. Like, I don't, I don't know when that's coming. So are you going to you still want to be together? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, uh, you know, and just, you know, realizing even in that crux of like, yeah, this is, you know, that relationship kind of fizzling out was, more confirmation to me that I was like, yo, to my DNA, like I'm an artist. And I come from like a tradition, again, like I mentioned earlier, like I grew up in a in a Latino community. And if you know anything about that, like Mexican American, like male work ethic of like, you just work. There's no excuse, right. men work. For better or for worse, as toxic as it might've been, it gave me a work ethic that says there's no excuse. Everybody got the same 24 hours. What's the problem? Just work. You know, oh, you got a job, you can't do your music. Are you? Are you? What? What are you talking about? Right. You yeah. know, what are you, Five o'clock comes around at some right point, now? right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. what are you doing right now? Complaining about the fact that you can't do music. Well, why don't you just do music right now? You know, and that sort of like attitude was like kind of always like. So I was never afraid of like a long day. And then at some point, it was like I realized I wasn't doing either of these things well because both of them were getting half of my time. Mm. My art was getting half of my time and my teaching was getting half of my time. So I'm not doing either of these things well. And I was like, I want to do something well. So at that point, it was like, all right, I need to make a decision. And I chose art, you know. Was there a leap of faith or did you already have a certain amount of? No, it was so terrifying. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm pretty good with like finances. So like I had decent, a couple months saved. And also again, this attitude of like, I'm just not afraid of working. Like if I have to go get a, I substitute taught for a while in, you know, in the in-between time. So like, I was like, well, I'll go, I'll, I know what I'm doing. I have a credential. I can go substitute, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or, or I could clean a toilet or a garage or mow a lawn because it's just work. Like I'm not afraid to work, you know? Uh, so I think already having that inside of that leap of faith. And then also it was at the time that like, really how secure is this teaching job? The tenured teachers are getting fired. There's no more money in the California budget for education. They were thinking about shortening the, the school week because we're running out of money. So I was like, well, this don't seem that secure then. Why am I here for security? It's not safe. You know? So I was like, well, if it's not going to, if that's not safe, then why don't I do something that I really want to do that's not safe, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of right. So, and again, like, I think, I think for me, for which I would say to any creative is like, I'm just, nothing is, it's just work. Like, I'm not, like, I can't stress this enough. Like you cleaning the toilet is a part of the creative process because it's just work. Yes. Yeah. You like, know, I, I underline that one, right? You totally, it's that, yeah. it's that, that, 
your your creative life is not separate from your life. No, right? it's, it's all the same. Yeah, uh, I listened to a pod of one of the Monty Python writers, and he was saying the same thing. He's like, well, when, when do I have time to write? He's like, well, I start writing when I wake up, like the process of getting dressed, making my coffee, sitting down, mm-hmm. sweeping the floor. It's all writing. It's all yeah. part of it. You know, you don't say I have to sit down at my laptop or with the pen and pad and that's when the no, I've been writing all day, you know. That's the way I feel about mowing the lawn and cleaning the toilet. Still cre- I'm still creating. I'm still writing. Yeah. But it's just work. I'm not afraid of work. Like and and that's I think has carried me really just interesting just work. You know, yeah. yeah. And and you also say like security. I mean, one of my favorite things about this last year and a half that I think is going to really help all of humanity is that yeah this idea that security is a good thing or that you can plan something out is great because life does not work that way like we have no idea what's coming tomorrow and that's yes. always been the case and then people end up getting really disappointed oh i wanted it to go this way and it went that way and then that becomes this real disappointment i want to be no like you aren't god why do you think you know the way things should be yeah. like the way it is yeah. is the way it should be and when the shit hits the that's fan that's like that's exactly what needed to happen in that moment Absolute you know facts man yeah, and, and you're disappointed on something you made up. Yes. It was supposed to go like this. Well, you made that up. Who said that? You made that up. Right. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, like, why don't you let that go? That's that's your imagination. How it went, like you said, how it went is how it went, and that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah or you, it wasn't. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And, and that's a, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. Right. You mentioned that too, that in the book, I forget which page it's on when you were talking about being really disappointed when you like your flight was canceled. You had to get off the airplane. Yeah. You had this whole plan of how things were supposed to go. And then the world clearly was like, prop, no, sorry, you ain't leaving nope. right now. And talk a little bit about that moment when that shift in your thinking from this should be and go this way to openness to what, what, what simply is. Yeah, man, it's the beginning of the like the unraveling of, you know, my imaginary version of myself. It's when you realize, yeah, I I made that up, man, you know, and then the amazing like orchestra that has to happen that you had nothing to do with for any of this shit to work. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Is like when you pull back and notice it like, oh, my Lord. The world is spinning plates like all the time. And it's amazing that any of it works. Right. So then you just live a life and being in awe all the time, like just always amazed that like now you get to be an audience of it. You know what I mean? And you're like, man, I can't wait. I, Dude, what what is going to happen? You know what I'm saying? Like so rather than being like it's supposed to be this being like, yo, I can't wait to see what it is. I'm an audience to my own life, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, not not in a passive sense, but in a sense of like, I'm holding it loosely and I'm excited about what's going to be, you know? Totally. My aha moment now was probably about a decade ago. You know, I was riding my motorcycle on the 101 back to the valley and it was, it was during one of those recession summers where mm-hmm. like, you know, there was just like, there, there was no work in Hollywood. And I went back to tending bar at night. And during the day I was producing commercials and, you know, music videos, just kind of whatever I could to, to pay the bills. And so I was working like 80 hours a week yeah. and I'm riding my motorcycle back from the office in Hollywood. And mm-hmm. I might like, flip my emergency tank, which usually takes me about 20 miles. Mm-hmm. And this one uh-huh. day, my emergency tank decided it was going to take me about three. And oh. It's hot. It's the summertime. I got my leathers on. I'm on the 101 in traffic and I get off to the side and I'm like, I just want to be with my family and air conditioning. Uh And now I'm pushing a, you know, a, a, you know, 1100 CC beast of a motorcycle on the side of the freeway. And I'm like, thank you. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, I just wanted to be home. And then I thought, wait, why don't I just decide that that I, it's not that I should be at home where I should be is right now. And I can either be annoyed about this or I can be curious about it. Like, why is this, why is this happening? And not like, Oh, why is this happening? But why is this Mm -hmm. happening? And just being able to be curious. And it was kind of, when I read that story of yours, I was like, Oh Yeah. yeah. Like having that moment where you just realize 
I, I'm not in control and that doesn't mean yeah. being passive, but it means yeah. rather than being like thinking the way things should be or the way I think them, because somehow I am God and I know so much shit that I know yeah. the way things should be. Instead I can say, yeah, huh? Like, I'm like a tiny blip in time and space. Yeah. Why don't I just get curious and be like, hmm, That's good. what's this all about? Yeah. You know? Yes. Nailed it. So those frustrating moments, you know, mm-hmm. one hopes that it brings it brings a little extra insight. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It still sucks. It's still hot on the side of the 101. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but exactly. Like, <laughs> and you still got to get home, but still, like, yeah. all right, well, you know. I'm not going to add to that suckiness by carrying this other thing, you know, that's, that's, that's really yeah. the key. That's the key. So in this email I got, it says, tell us about the connection between coffee and music. Oh, I want yes. to get to that. I love it. That's a good <laughs> question. So my daughter teases me about the fact that whatever she's doing, whatever she's into, I'm like, that came from black people. Yeah. Like I just tell about <laughs> anything. I'm like, scroll through any TikTok trend. And it's like, that's black people, you know, yeah. on period, yes, queen, like any of this stuff. I'm like, this is, it's black, it's blackness. You know what I'm saying? So I do kind of like in a sense of, of understanding, like just, just how like pop culture is made. It's like a lot of it, you know, all the way back to blues and jazz and rock and roll and hip hop. I'm like, this is black music. So anyway, all that to say, I fell in love with coffee first, just like anybody else, I'm just addicted. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like, there's no other way around it. I'm just addicted, you know? But then you find out later as I, as I got into like specialty coffee and making sure like I'm, I'm actually making a good cup, then it, you learn like, wait, this only grows at the equator. It's, it's discovered in Ethiopia. So then when that happens, you start looking around at these like really fancy coffee shops and you like, but ain't no brown people here. You know, and then so then it was like, oh, dang, now this is a justice issue, you know, because I'm like, it's yet another thing that was birthed out of these people that exist at the equator, you know, or came from the equator. And now what we have has been commodified and sold back to us in a place where we're not allowed to be in. So so for me, it was like coffee became another thing that it's like, well, as much as I can help, I'm not going to let what happened to hip hop happened to coffee, you know, it's right. like, <laughs> you know, we can, we can be at the table and it's not so much a, like a blocking out of others, but like an inclusion and authenticity rather than the commodifying of something that was supposed to be remarkably communal. I know you, you, you spent time in East Africa. So you like the coffee ceremony is communal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's slow. Like if somebody offer you in for a cup of coffee, that's an hour, you know, cause yeah. like they got to roast it they're roasting it, you know, and then grinding it and then serving it, you know? So, so yeah, like it's just supposed to be, it's supposed to be a communal ceremony where you slow down and you enjoy the day and there's a conversation there, but just to package it and sell it back. It's like, yeah, nah, dude, we can't let this happen again. You know? Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Actually, my, um, my fiance, Sarah, she started a, when we were living there, one of the reasons we went back is, you know, she grew up in a village in central Kenya and mm-hmm. she lost her home in a civil war and moved to, you know, a slum in Nairobi. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it just happens to be really smart and got us got to go to UCLA and got a scholarship. And she noticed when she was here, she's like, man, there's nothing made in Africa like on the shelves here. And so yeah. when she graduated college, it was like that was one of that was how I knew that this was going to be the person I'd be with for the rest of my life. Because yeah. she was just like really, really early on. She's like, when I graduate, I want to go back to Kenya. Would you come? And I was like, dude, sign me up. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do want to go to Kenya. I will move to Kenya. I will move to the other side of the planet for you. Yes. But yeah, just kind of in but, connection with that, you know, going there, she's like, you know what? Like, like there's so much beauty. There's so much potential. There's so much that Kenya, that Africa has to offer. Like I, Everywhere I go in America, there's stuff from China, there's stuff from Germany, there's you made in USA, but where's the stuff made from Africa? And so, yeah, now she's making ma- bags and wallets in Kenya and bringing them here, and it's super exciting. So, um, That's so dope, man. Because, yeah, it's like even like as an as a African-American man, you know what I'm saying, a black man, you're like, where's all the black people in leadership? Where's, yeah. where's black people in China? Well, okay, well, you haven't been to Africa. 
Right. Because I'm like, well, the whole they're in charge there. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So like, <laughs> uh, you're like, yeah. So for me, yeah, touching soil and other in Africa, like, yeah, you know, bringing it full circle. You you you're like, well, this country isn't full of black made products. Yeah. Like they, right. <laughs> of course, everything on the shelf is black made. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when you see that and you're like, well, they live perfectly fine. This is, they have their problems, but hell, so do we. Yeah. Like what, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you, is, are we really any better? You know what I mean? So especially like my time, like I said, in Ethiopia and South Africa, you start traveling the world. You just like, oh man, I, I believed a bad story. Yeah. A, a total, oh man, you just, oh, I love yeah. that. So that's a perfect little circle back as we, as we close it up is I believed a bad story. Sarah's been saying this too. Like we have to change the narrative of how yeah. we see Africa, but the reality is we have to change yeah. the narrative of how we see almost everything. Like Facts. we actually, we have to, we terraform uh, to use your, you know, your analogy yeah. here and we have to start right with us, we have to start. What are the stories that we're believing? What are the stories yep. that we're telling? What is the language that we're using and really becoming yep. aware so that we can change this? The future does not need to mimic the past because we actually have the the ability to create, to think new yep. thoughts. And Absolutely. that's what you just so beautifully covered here in your book. So I want to ask you, if you would, I have one potential, which I guess is kind of a long one. I like all your long poems, I guess. But is yeah, there thanks. one you would like to read? If not, the one I was going to say was 20 years, which I loved, but I know it's a little long. But yeah. either that or another one that you want to uh, share with our listeners as we close out this uh, amazing time we've had with you today. Man, I think there's a climbing mount comparison. It's a shorter poem. Great. But it's sort of the idea of like, I never stopped to wonder why I thought about this or mm. why I thought this. All right. Okay. When he lost his footing climbing the comparison mountain, he thought himself ill-equipped to summit. What do them have that I don't? The question thunderclapped the clock hands and gave him pause. Silly me, he thought. He was asking the question backwards. What do I have that them don't? The answer is his superpower. He has himself. And rather than using his powers to climb, he remembered he don't even like rock climbing. Nice. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Thank I don't even, you why, like, I don't even want to, why am I even, I don't even like rock climbing. Why am I even on this hill, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you yeah. so much uh, for joining thank us. Thank you, man. And uh, I just want to, uh, for all of our listeners who haven't yet, uh, I got lucky. I got a an advanced copy, yeah. and I'm all marked up already. But if you don't have a copy of Terraform, Building a Better World by Propaganda, put it high on your list. It's a fun, beautiful read that uh, I think will really will really change your life. And I think if Prop has his way, uh, it'll change the world. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much.